Uh, we're really glad to have everyone here today. And some of you, I don't know if um, those of you that are joining us for the workshop in the next two, couple of days, can you raise your hands if we can see you? Yeah, great. That's great. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is kind of the kickoff. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Great to see you all now and, and welcome. We'll do some introductions tomorrow when we have everyone join together. Um, and we will be having the chat box going here. Renee and Jackie will be watching that. Uh, we're really honored to have Greg Shane here with us. Greg is, um, boy, Greg, I always wonder how to frame it, but you really were, were one of the guides with the glass gym, which we are now uh, coming to know as Rainbow Jewel, and I hope you'll tell us the reason that you're shifting more towards the Rainbow Jewel. It's a, a very, to me, kind of a deep journey, and, and we hope to yeah. hear about that from you. <clears throat> Greg's joining by phone today because he's also not really uh, able to access the video option right now, so um, I think Bill might have some glass gem things, that, the pictures he can show us, and uh, we can yeah. visualize together. I think most people at this point are familiar with Glass Gem. It's always really um, touching to hear the story from Greg and his kind of spiritual journey with it. And I, I will, would really like to just turn it over to you and Bill to talk about that. And um, no. just want to say, though, that <clears throat> you've made such a profound impact on, on my life and my seed journey. And I just really appreciate your presence with the seeds and, and the sharing. I've been able to work with Greg to share the rainbow jewel with our seed stewards. And that's just been such an honor. Needless to say, we sold out pretty quickly, sold out, so to speak, ran out, gave them away freely, <laughs> of course, as, <laughs> as we tend to and prefer to do. And I think there'll be another round, though, as, as we see this yeah. next grow out. But I'll turn it over to you and Bill, and, and hopefully we'll hear, hear about that journey here in the spirit yeah. of seeds and grains um this is i do want to say also that this is how we like to kind of set the tone of our seed schools and our seed saving is why why we're here on that level um which really i think is the reason that you know people that i talk to do what they do with seeds it's coming from a really deep place within and and being part of this really ancestral um you know just this lineage of, of saving seeds that the humanity humans have been doing so with that i'll turn it over okay bill did you want to say a few words i know you're like the you're there starting and opening things up well i just um i just want a couple of things one is thank you Thank you for being such an Thanks important. for inviting me over, yeah. yeah. Thanks for no. inviting me to, to share, yeah. Well, you've just been a, a profound influence on my life. And I've it's been so uh, heartwarming to see you grow in your story and voice about all of this. I mean, it was all packed in there, and you had done such great work when I met you. But I think um, I've just uh, been blown away by how well you're telling the story and we need your story if that's the that's the only other thing that i would say and yeah. and i say that from my own personal experience especially after going to hopi and experiencing wow. a kind a kind of farming that i can't explain using our western oh, yeah. rational <laughs> scientific story it just doesn't work and i've been a serious yeah. student of horticulture and garden for 40 years yeah. You know, I was a John Jevonsite and and I've grown gardens every year of my life probably. And I could not explain what they do there or how they do it. Yeah. I still don't wow. know. And you helped me understand a story that might better explain that so much that that's I'm heading in the direction of your story now. <laughs> After all of these years. So please thank you for um, okay. For being on and um, say what you like if you if you need something I might um, chime in if it's okay with a question or a clarification from time to time. Yeah. Is that okay. Okay. Certainly. Yeah. We can have this interactive. I've got, you know, I just kind of want to start up and and see where it goes. Um, a little about me. I'm like all of you. I've done gardening for most of my adult life and. Uh, 
uh, have been, you know, I've got a horticulture and botany background and I've been, uh, always been into the natural world in, in a variety of ways and, you know, uh, saving seeds or collecting native plants and growing things. And, and, uh, and that's sort of the, the flavor of how I approach things. I did things primarily all on my own as a, and as, as an individual and, uh, just at pretty much just as a hobby. I had other things I did as my main livelihoods and stuff. And so, um, in, and in doing that, I mean, I'm, it's kind of an illustration of this spirit of the seeds theme, because what you were just saying about how this influenced you and was profound, I'm like this basic gardener that just sort of fell into this. And, and I just sort of handled it and worked with it and passed it on. And it was that spirit of those seeds that had that incredible voice. And, uh, you know, I had no idea what I was getting into when I, you know, first started to find out about this particular corn. It was just like I stumbled into it. And I'll get into that. So that story started back in 1995 when I ran in, I was at a, this was in Oklahoma. I was at a herb and native plant gathering. And there was this old gentleman there with all these display cases full of all these different heritage type corns from all these different tribes and such. And I was looking, you know, I was just going, looking at stuff, talking to people and I'm looking at what he had. And right down at the very bottom was two little ears about three inches long that had all these rainbow colors in them. And I went, Whoa, I got to get to know this guy. This is important. And, uh, and then I maybe about, Oh, several weeks later, the friend of mine who, who told me about him and this gathering said, Hey, Carl's going to be in town. You want to go, you know, see him again? I said, sure. So I get there and he like takes like one ear of this stuff. And like, he just happened to have it in his pocket and he scrunches off like about 50 seeds into the palm of my hand. Okay. And I'm going, wow. Okay. Uh, and of course, later on, I got more samples of this from him, you know, so I, I didn't just start everything on those 50 seeds. I had, you know, the diversity, I had enough presence of mind to keep asking him, Hey, you got any more of that? Um, and so he hands me that. And probably not long after that was the, well, I had, I, I had the seed with me and, and it was probably a couple of weeks after that, uh, Murrah building bombing that happened in Oklahoma City, which was a real transformative thing to the collective consciousness of that area and to everybody there. And I happened to, so we're all wide open, you know, when things like that happen. And, and I happened to have this seed in, in a little thing in my pocket and I pulled it out and poured it into my hand. Um, and something just said, this seed is going to change things. And there it was in my hand right there. And it's kind of like if you ever have, imagine if you have, uh, you know, like it's a, you, you've met a person, like maybe it's the mate that you're going to spend the next 50, 60 years with and raise a family. Maybe it's a mentor that, that is really going to put you on a, a total path, a spiritual teacher, whatever some person that is going to, or event that is going to set a tone and a direction for your life. Okay. And imagine the instant before, you know, that person or event exists. And that's the power that's in the seed. It's like the potentiality of something. And that was what that sense of it. When I had that handful of seeds, it was like, whoa, and I had no idea what that meant, okay? And uh, so that was the year I started planting it, okay? So I planted it all, and I had like a backyard, and I grew it all out. And it was really kind of strange. It had really, un it had not, didn't look at all like it did now. I mean, it had these colors and different things, but it was like, whoa, this is kind of wild. 
And, and then I got to know Carl more, you know, and I would go and visit him. He lived like about three, a about couple hundred, 250 miles way up in the northwest corner of Oklahoma, or just way up in there, out in the plains. And, uh, and he had his little place, and he had all these corn displays, and he worked with a lot of other kinds of corn. He worked with some other kinds of crops. And this rainbow corn was just sort of like a little thing, just one of his many experiments. And uh, so that was kind of like, you know, it wasn't like that big of a deal. He had, he had worked with that with three or four different strains from Osage and Pawnee and possibly one Cherokee type that went into that. And uh, so I was able to get, you know, more samples of it and such. And uh, one of the things that Carl had, he had a lot of, he like met with different people a lot. And he had sayings and and sort of like uh, you might say teachings that he would have. He would say different things and explain things to people in in metaphor or 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 symbology or or one-liners. And uh, one of the things he would say would be the seed remembers. That was kind of his essence of what he would say. And. Of course, we're now understanding that the seed's influenced by the per- the people that plant, the people that handle it, you know, the experience it has in its environment. We we understand that we're understanding epigenetics. We're understanding that everything is recorded, okay? And uh, even, you know, if it's respected or not, that puts a trauma on it. And, uh, you know, these things carry over. We know that this happens with human beings, that these things pass from generation to generation. And uh, another thing he said is he talked about, he wasn't really talking about that rainbow corn specifically. He was just saying, he would say there's 144 colors, tones, and sounds. Uh, Promise of the rainbow in the sky, 144 colors, tones, and sounds, a new language of man. And it was like, that stuck with me. It was like, there was a lot of different things he said about the grandmothers will reappear in the children. If you do the prayer and ceremony, the old ones will reappear. I mean, there was all this stuff about the spiritual side of how this genealogy, which is just the physical part of it, would re would manifest and unfold. And so it was like, whoa. And one of the things he'd do is he would tell stories about people that he knew that he would had introduced to just planting the corn, you know, whatever kind it was. And he he had these stories of these people would have these transforming, like, mystical experiences by growing this corn. And, I mean, he would, like, get all emotional and stuff and go, man, this is and, – and it was kind of really – intense and and of course i was kind of like interested in getting hey you got any more of that cool seed no (laughs) but um so he would tell these stories and then and then i i kept planting it and growing it and then it was in 99 i moved out to new mexico and took a job in santa fe and i was still working with it and kind of in that time frame i had gone through some personal things that were pretty uh like uh you might say intense in in their own way and i was really trying to come to grips with all of that and so i was processing my personal you know challenges that had happened around that time i met carl and maybe over the you know two or three years just past that and uh and as i was growing this corn I was seeing these colors and these these manifestations of of this rainbow. We just called it rainbow corn at the time. Emerge and and it was kind of like this corn was trying to find its identity. Uh, it was like these colors would come out in different bursts and different patterns and different themes that were more in a nascent form than what you all have probably seen it to be. And what was really amazing that kind of uh came to light is the the way this corn was was expressed
And so there, uh, what he meant. So it was still in its kind of like wild and nascent form. And there's a picture that you all used on the, on that, I guess the, the, where you're, you're on your website about the, this particular seed social and your little course you're doing. And it looks like it's got three little bitty ears of this kind of corn. And there's one that's kind of a purple, like a solid purple. And then there's two others. That's the early stuff. Oh. That's when it was wandering around trying to figure out what it was. Okay. But it was, so, so I planted it. I did it, did get to plant it in New Mexico, but I really didn't have anywhere to grow it seriously. Until in 2005, I met a fella named Jose Lucero. I was introduced to him because I wanted to grow this corn, and I wanted to maybe even find somebody in the native community and such that had the water and the land and wanted to do it. And this friend of mine says, I know it's the exact person. And so I met him, and two days later, we're planting corn. And we're not only planting a rainbow corn, but we're planting blue corn and all these different things, you know, like you're not supposed to do, you know, all together in different plots, all in this big area. And he's got the irrigation water and we can flood irrigate and all that. And so this is Santa Clara Pueblo, north of Santa Fe. And so what I had is I had an area where I did the rainbow corn. And then I also had this uh, on the, on the Pueblos in Northern New Mexico, the native people, one of the things they like to grow is a, is a little popcorn that's about the same size as this rainbow corn. They're kind of like cousins, you know, they look alike. And, uh, but they're, they're from totally different families. Okay. But they're, they're together. Okay. And so I had some of that seed that I had picked up from around different places up there. And I kind of had a sense that, you know, maybe this rainbow corn needs to be exposed to the spirit of the northern New Mexico corn so that it can like find itself. So anyway, I the stuff that kind of was closest in proximity to the rainbow corn at that time was this Pueblo popcorn. And it was like it was kind of like the song when East End boys meet meet, meet West End girls and uh magic happens, okay? And let them dance. And so there was some passive crossing with that and so then i you know harvested that and then i grew for like three years like this and uh uh it started taking form i started noticing the themes really starting to gel and to stabilize and i had to give them names like little cartoon characters so that I could remember, oh, that's one of those, that's one of those. So there were like, like themes or clans or such of this rainbow corn that were starting to like reoccur. And it, it ended up that there might have been 20 or so of them and that I had names for. And, uh, and right around in there was that one that appeared. And of course, I, I was putting names on, I, then I was taking all these photographs because I was like, what the heck is this, man? This is all wild. I mean, I was just learning about it on my own. You know, I broke all the rules. I didn't even know the rules, you know? And um, and so there, there I'm looking at uh, these colors and it, one of them was that one that I put the name Glass Gem on. It was part of a series of slides I did for a friend of mine who wanted me to give a talk on it. So I had all these funny names, and then there was this one, and that was the one that Bill got a hold of and, and put on his website, and that you know the story about that. And so I'm growing this corn. I'm doing all this stuff, and uh, uh, in the fourth year, I just I, – I said, okay, this stuff looks pretty good. I'm just going to take the best seed, the best stuff from what I got and not plant any of the other kinds of corn around the area. And I just took that one kind and just grew a big old deal of it. And I just, I put all that seed in and I just stood back and I said, do your stuff. I said, go for it. And I just let it grow, took care of it, brought it through and harvested that. And it like, it had like made a quantum jump to another level. And it was like, whoa. And it was like, yeah, this stuff, if you ask, this stuff will listen. So, it was just, I never did any hand pollinating or any, I don't have patience for that. I'll be honest. 
I just did like, let's just trust the swarm intelligence and see what happens. And uh, so I just called the chaos theory method of plant breeding and, you know, just let them go. It's kind of like what Joseph talks about in the land race concept. You can just amazing things happen when you let stuff do that. And uh, so anyway, there it was. And that was the seed 2008 that the year later I, I brought it out to Bill who I'd met sometime before when I was out in Arizona for a while. I brought him that seed, a bunch of it. And I said, here, you might be interested in, and cause he was teaching classes and stuff. I said, maybe, you know, this might be something you can use. And I gave him a whole bunch of photos and I said, here you go. And then I took off and I was on a hiatus doing other things for a while. And 2012 comes around and, and some friends of mine are saying, Hey, I just saw that picture on this website, you know, like an Australian food magazine or something and like another, and I'm going, Whoa, something's going on out there. And that was that viral deal that went on out there. And so I, I check on back to Bill and I find out he's now the director, him and Bell are co-directors of native seed search. And I'm going, Oh my God. Yeah. Those, I know those guys I've bought seed from them. I have wanted to give them some of that rainbow corn, but I figured they were more academic and more like, you know, a, something more purist so they would want something that was really a traditional seed not something wild and crazy so i never did give it to them but then bill ended up being the vector for that to go to native seed search and uh and it kind of started taking off and they were going to try to grow it and put it in their their uh batch of seed and i thought well you know i'm not into the selling and buying stuff but that's a non-profit organization and i thought i believe in their mission uh, and I thought, hey, if it can help them, great. Okay, if it can help them, and it did. And uh, and so I believe they had their first big batch in 2013. And so I was in a place in 2013 where I could grow a crop. So I grew another crop of it, and I was back in the game. And I thought, okay. Um, so it, like, the corn itself was running the show. I could not have done what it did to get itself out there and then what through the native seed people and how it, it jumped the fence and got out of the corral and I'd been giving it away for a lot of years you know whenever I was at a gathering you know those years before I would just hand it out and say this stuff is really neat if you're interested in trying it just do it so it it went out there before uh, uh to lots of different people and uh um so it's out there in that way so anyway, there we are, and I want to tell a couple of things about kind of the spirit side of it, just touch on it, that happened around that time. Uh, and uh, one of them is there's a, a very dear friend, well, Carl Barnes had some people really close to him that were very, very intuitive. And... Uh, they used to do kind of a technique, and I know you all have been exposed to this kind of stuff. Now, are you able to, you all able to still hear me? Am I on? Can yeah. Oh, yeah. Anybody on voice? Okay, no, good. I meant yeah, I'd, I'd good. be losing the call. I'm in a place where my signal should be steady. So anyway, one of the things that Carl and some of these people did was they would do like a meditative, uh, they would call it going into the library, okay? Mm -hmm. And you know, back uh, earlier, I was talking about this thing about the 144 colors and tones and the new language. And one of the, th the thing about that is that there's like a codex that's universal that contains our genealogy of the human being, of all the life forms on the earth. It's reflected in language because that's codes that are passed from generation to generation the memes, the, the, the propagation of patterns and energy that, that take place and music and all this stuff is part of this one sort of expression. And it manifests through these different media that we look at, like the genetic, the DNA and the different things, but it's sort of in all of that. And so, uh, Going into the library is like, how do you access intuitively what they would take an ear of corn 
and go into a trance and get information. Okay. And, uh, and usually it was very cryptic kind of metaphoric, kind of like, uh, like poetic type. Uh, but it would tell this, this corn would tell its story. It might even share, you know, I've been through the wars and the famines. I w- I've been through the good times of all this. Uh, and, and it was really fascinating. And I got to participate in a little of that and I would get these little impressions. And so we ended up after that 2013 little crop that I grew, I was able to grow a nice big batch of it down in Southern New Mexico. And so I had a batch of it. Bill had his batch and they were getting ready to get it out there. And, and in that fall, I'm there. And so one of these people, Diana Henry, we had, we got her out here to this part of the country. She lives in Kansas. We got her out there and she's really good with doing that going into the library technique. So she, we had a get a get together with a bunch of people over there in, uh, oh, it was near Phoenix. And we had a bunch of this rainbow corn and we just, we made a big circle of it. So everybody had like a piece and it created this big circle. And we all went into this meditation, you know, and did this. And uh, so everybody, we had our impressions that we got. So we were doing the, the library, but, now we're doing it with this rainbow corn. Okay, wow. Okay, let's see what happens. All right. And um, the impression I got was a real fleeting, quick, like vignette in which the image came of I'm standing out there in the field and it's like after the harvest, like the corn, ha- the stalks are all dry and it's like going into winter. And I'm seeing myself feeling like. Uh, kind of like the empty nest syndrome, like the parent and whose kids have gone out and, you know, gone, moved away and, you know, he raised them and they've moved away and they're, they're gone. And, and there's that sort of bittersweet feeling of, uh, you know, they've gone out and everything. They're not at the house anymore. And then the image shifts and I'm like uh, at a train station, but it's like a, it's like an open air, very bright open air sunlit kind of almost almost like a european looking outdoor open air train station and there's like all these people they're all like in their 20s all these young people just like a hundreds of them and they're all waiting to get onto these trains that are going to go everywhere and when i'm looking at it it's like the the ki- all these people all these they have their backpacks and everything and they're all in different bright colors, just bright colors of every color of the rainbow. And I went, Oh my God, those are every trait that's in this corn. And it's getting ready to go everywhere. And then the impression that I got was it's going to go and disperse itself into the total genome of the rest of corn and it will lose its identity and not be seen again and that is okay because that's what it's supposed to do and um, that was that thing that i got it was like in an instant you know the whole like download okay so anyway then that same about that same time and this is kind of strange and you know i'm kind of going out here into you know a different realm here so i know you guys can go there so um i have a friend a very very dear friend who is also a very gifted intuitive uh but wasn't part of carl's group of people and i was visiting with her about the same time right after i grew that first little crop and actually, I hadn't seen her in about five years. So I'm telling her, you know, kind of telling her what's been going on and such. And uh, and uh, some of my little ventures and stuff. And I, and I just on the side, just kind of as a little add on, I said, oh, by the way, I've been growing this, you know, real interesting corn. That's all these different colors. It's just been pretty, you know, kind of been a journey for me. I've been just doing this. And, and she just like stopped me in my tracks and said, I'm getting like she was getting the download, okay, right there in the room. And and she said, 
she said, I have had experiences of tuning into the spirit of plants, you know, before. She said, this is different. She said, this corn is like hundreds of voices. Mm-hmm. So she's going, you know, but she's very experienced. I mean, she's really helped me a lot with some of my personal things and helped really be a guide for me. So she's saying, this is coming through. She said, I want to get quiet and I want to like, let this come through. Okay. And so that's what she did. And I, she, this came through and she set it out and voiced it. And, and essentially what it was, it was that it was telling, and I transcribed the whole thing. I've got it. I don't have it with me here, but it's like about a page long. And she literally channeled the rainbow corn and it, the, the message, the way it came through literally describes what has happened you know, that we all know that happened with this corn and how it got out there and people were inspired and it helped with the seed saving movement and et cetera, et cetera. It was like, there it was. And she had no, I mean, it was like, she just like, let it come through and there it was. And I went, whoa, okay. So that's another little branch of the story. Just take it for, you know, however that comes to you. And uh, so there we are. And okay, so it got out there, jumped the fence. Bill, Bill's organization, Bill and Bell, are are doing this gangbuster job on the on the corn and the, the, all the seeds and everything there, and native seeds in Tucson. And and I, they invited me to come out, and I told kind of the same story that I'm telling you right now. And uh, and then it got out there, and everybody got to know about it because they put the seed packets out there. And I knew that, you know, okay, this is eventually going to become commercialized. I mean, it went through a nonprofit at first. And I was, I said, you know, if it started out through a nonprofit, that's a good way to start. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's going to go out in the commercial world, might pick it up. It it might go crazy. I had no idea, but I'm not doing that path, but you know, it'll do what it'll do. And you know, that corn is going to run its own destiny. So you know, like those kids in the train station. So I'm going, okay. And uh, so there we are, and it's going out there. And you, I've like made the statement out there that, okay, I'm like the guy that doesn't sell seeds and all that. I think it's like, you know, maybe it's better to just give them out and all that. But, you know, I understand that, you know, there's a place for that, okay? There's certainly a place for the professionals that grow the agricultural seed that that goes out to the farmers and all that, you know, especially if it's non-GMO, of course. You know, I've met some people in that trade that are just like super, you know, like respectable people. And, uh, and I, you know, I've kind of had mixed feelings, but I think it's more not so much about the buy and sell. And I, I, I would say that, you know, if you take the seed, and you put it under a a condition, okay? Because I my one of my sayings is like the seed is the currency, and that maybe the wealth is really the relationships, and that's how the people in the past times they would keep these seeds in their families, and then they would trade, and they would go through mar- when there was a marriage, the seed the seeds of the plants would be exchanged, you know, the, you know the different l- lines of people that were coming together in the families they would bring literal seeds you know to the to the marriage and that would be part of the blending of the families and and i thought you know the wealth is in the relationships you know and it's the buy and sell stuff has only been in recent time and and to me the 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 inspiration that i was able to to find through the journeying with with the seeds is worth more than some of these people that I know that made a lot of money off of that rainbow corn, you know, and uh, I mean, a lot. And uh, I know the grower who grew for a particular one of them. I know that there's been some outfits, the smaller ones that really did respect it. You know, they, they did put it out on the market, but they respected it and I can honor them for that. I go, yeah, that's, that's fine. One in particular, I know the grower 
he did an incredibly good job and I'm totally like behind him a hundred percent. And he was able to, you know, do well with that. But I felt like that the operation that, that did market it, that particular one, I don't feel like they really respected the seed. And, uh, but I don't know. I just feel that. And that's kind of like what I feel like when you do that, it puts a mark on it. It puts a psychic mark on the lineage. And we're going to, I'm going to jump out of the rainbow corn and I'm going to go into another little deal. That's, I was just using this as kind of like jumping point, jumping off point, because we want to fast forward to 7,000 years ago. And, but I want to tell, there was one very beautiful story that Leanne, no, actually, I think it was Leanne and both Bell, I think, sent to me. There was a, there was a, a man in Pennsylvania who somehow got a hold of some of this, what we're, we've been calling glass gem. And, uh, and he was able to grow a crop. This man had not very long before his wife of decades had passed away. And he had also, he was grieving her passing and at the same time having some financial troubles. And they almost, they, they were about to lose the family farm. Okay. And he got some of this seed and grew it and did market it. And the amount that they got was the amount they needed to save the farm. And so, and then I have yet, I, then I was, it was his daughter telling the story. And I said, yeah, this has a place. And that sort of like, kind of like was a counterbalance to the other thing that I was saying that I didn't feel it was respect that I said, you know, okay, this opens me up to a bigger possibility. You know, there is a place, but it's all in the intent behind it. Just like all kinds of genetic modifications and, and breeding, even in traditional plant breeding, which is great. You know, the GMO stuff, I'm still not too sold on. I don't think any of you are. It's the consciousness behind it that is what really matters. So let's fast forward to 7,000 years ago in central Mexico, and you got Teosinte is starting to figure out who it is. And uh, a bunch of years ago, I was down in uh, around El Paso coming up into New Mexico. It was one of my trips before I moved out here. And I was taking a back road and there's this valley called Mesilla Valley. And there's all these little towns that are sort of strung along the river there. And there was like a health clinic in this one little town that had these beautiful murals painted on the side of it. And it was that old like uh, artwork that you see that's out of Mexico. And so I took some photos of it. Uh, and uh, one of the murals, this is like, old Mesoamerican traditional art. And one of the murals has like the sun god, okay, like an image of this big figure, this golden being that is standing there over a, feet, a small plot of corn and chilies and beans and stuff. And these, these people that are like, like peasant type people, you know, farmers, are, are like bowing down and this sun god is like shooting these rays of light into all the plants and all the people. And it's like, it, you see these little corn plants like lighting up, like it shows like a glow around them. And I'm going, maybe they got some help back then in the days of the Teosinte. Maybe there was some kind of extraterrestrial influence that, <laughs> Because when you look at that, you go, how in the world could that little simple grass suddenly like in, be dispersed into two continents and have every different shape and color and expression you could ever imagine as it was brought out by the different people that traded it and passed it on and migrated and whatever happened all the way up into Canada and all the way down to the Argentina and Chile and all that. I mean, my God, how in the world did it have all that? How'd that happen? Okay. So there's that pure potentiality. I'm going, well, 
all those people were going, they would grow that corn when it became corn. Maybe it got some help. I don't know. Eventually, it became corn. We had 4,000 years ago, Chapalote got into America. What is it? The Hopi, the Southwest. It was like 3,000 years later, it finally made its way into where we are, the Southwest. And about that same time, it got up into the southeast part of the country, up into the Cherokee and the, the Shawnee, and all those people got a hold of something like that. And the, the mound builders and all those people got a hold of it. Well, how did it get all that? So there we are with the people are going through all these intense experiences of times of good harvest, times of war, times of famine, times of peace, whatever, and they're growing their seed all through this. Those people are having epigenetic imprinting upon their consciousness and their genetics and their experience and their spirituality and their ceremony. And the corn is going through being exposed to different climates, different soils, different emotions that the people are going through, different exchanges among the clans, different exchanges among all these people. And all these different weird kind of colors are showing up and people are like, so, you know, they're, take, they're taking these different colors that have significant meanings. This is our corn that we use for the young girls coming of, the age, coming of age. This is the corn we use for the, you know, this ceremony, that ceremony. So you get different things. And so I'm, I'm going, well, maybe over those thousands of years, then there's the experience that the crops, the corn had. And the experiences that the people had are being recorded in their spirituality and in their genealogy. And there's like two streams of information that are running parallel to each other, the corn and the human being. And that if you look at the old stories, I mean, if you look at these traditions, every darn one of them from Peru all the way up, they say the corn is the human being. The corn came from the, the human being came from the corn, you know, and you got the three sisters, you know, maybe the beans are like horses and beans are like horses and the squash are like birds, you know, like sitting out there in the field and the corn is a human being. And, and all these traditions are there. And so those two streams get braided together and become one thing that transfers back and forth and the native people understand this and they do this thing up in this part of the country called the corn dance in the pueblos and all of them do it about the same time they don't they don't do it at the planting time well they have a ceremony for that and they don't particularly do this at the harvest time which is later they do it at the first part of august this is where they invite the people of the, the public in. They all do this thing called the corn dance. And around here, that's the time that the corn is tasseling and pollinating. Mm -hmm. And that's when the books are open. That's when the gen genetic codes are receptive to being influenced by the consciousness of the ceremony and their music and their drumming and their intention. And I'm going, this is how they've held it together for thousands of years. And so that's why they revere it like they do. Not only as their sustenance, but it was braided into their spirituality. And that's why, that's why, you know, it's like, that's why they don't just give it to everybody. Because they don't want it abused. They don't want. They want it to be respected. And uh, uh, you know that's that's where that comes in. And and it's literally what holds their language together. There was a man in the Kiowa people back in Oklahoma, and he was talking. And he said he was talking about his grandfather, who actually was down in 
he has part of his ancestry that's down in Mexico, and then the Kiowa are from the plains. And he was saying, if we didn't have the corn, if it wasn't for the corn, we would have lose, lost our language. And I went, oh, my God, that's what Carl was talking about. And I started like being like a, I would pick up these clues and it's like the language of the corn. And I'm going, you know, I'm out there in, when you're driving out there in Navajo country or the Northwest part of New Mexico, they, in the Navajo nation, they, it's a huge, you know, uh, you know, like a country in its own right there and the Hopi and everybody up there. And they have these radio stations where they broadcast in their native language. And you can just be up in there and you turn the radio on, driving around. And they're speaking the Diné language and, and you're hearing them talk and it's very soothing. And then every so often they'd have little fragments of English. Bill's talked about that, you know, listening to that. These little bits and pieces of English. And then they go on and you hear their language. And, it's, and I'm going, you know, if they really get back to planting that corn, they're going to remember those lost words that they have to use English for. And then you're just going to hear only their, not their language. And all about a couple of years ago, when we did the first dealie, the seed summit up there in Santa Fe, and this is, I'm about to the end of this. So in case you're wondering up there in Santa Fe, we're doing the seed summit and different people are there. And there was a lady who was from Navajo nation. Uh, elder type person, and uh, and every so often I had I kept passing her in the hallway or on the elevator or something. It was like there was something about I kept passing her, and and something just said this lady has a message for you. And I went okay, you know. And a little later, we're waiting for one of the presenters to to get started and i happen to be sitting right about where she is and we just struck up a little conversation just you know chit chat you know and she looks at me and says you know about epigenetics don't you i mean like out of the blue and i went a little and she says yeah our people know all about that and then and then we and then it probably the next thing she says oh and by the way uh, our people just came up with a word for cell phone. And I, I had not talked to her about that thing about the language and the seeds and all that. She just like says this. And I'm going to myself, you all have been planting the corn, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the, the, the long and the short of it, if you can wade through that. And, uh, you know, I know we have a little time if you want to open it up to anybody. But that's why, that's kind of why this stuff kind of took me on a rock and roll journey that I had no idea I was in for. And, and then, you know, but it's the seed and the consciousness in it that's running the show. I'm just like everybody else. I just like to garden. It just happened to run through my hands. It ran through Bill's hands. It just does it's it's running the show you know the seed has got you know like the lady who brought that message through the seed has got the message in it and it's going to do what it's going to do and we're all just sort of like serving that process you know we're just we're just the hands and feet you know and uh any, any comments any bill if you want to chime in uh Greg, can you, you know, hear me? Yeah. Yeah, um, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you said early on, and maybe we can bring this back around, we'll open it for questions if anybody wants to stay on. But yeah. when you said that um, you can find the grandparents among the children, that was something that Carl said yeah. once. And as you explained it to me, what so Carl Barnes was basically a corn breeder. I mean, in, you know, in our modern vernacular i mean he was yeah. planting corns and looking yeah. for corns and whereas yeah. modern oh, yeah. breeding is you know has specific goals yield flavor disease resistance uh -huh. and we're selecting out for those things it seems like yeah. carl yeah. was doing the opposite he was trying to find older varieties right the grandparent varieties of yeah yeah that had disappeared yeah. and the idea that you could breed corn to go back in evolution yeah 
into combinations yeah. of genetics that yeah. no one had seen for a long time. That was, that's really yeah. profound. And I think that's just a part of the story I'd yeah. like to bring out a little bit because it was out of yeah. that experience that Glass Jim Corn was born, right? Yeah, it was out of, well, what he had is he had a lot of, he was part Cherokee, he was half Cherokee. So he had that lineage. And then he was actually, his father about right before the Dust Bowl, his father moved, they moved out to the opposite side in the panhandle of Oklahoma, which is ground zero for the Dust Bowl. And he was a little kid during, they didn't like take off for California. They like stuck it out and they went through all that. And that area, they did a lot of, they grew a lot of corn. There was times where there was more rain and they grew a lot of, there was corn that grew out there. And then he had his Cherokee connection. And because he was back earlier in like, he probably started finding all these corns, you know, like more like what he was doing back in the 1940s and uh, maybe 50s. And that was when you could get a corn that was grown commercially or farming, you know, traditional regular farming. You could like Hickory King, okay, was a southeastern dent corn that was straight out of the Chickasaw. And it was still pretty diverse, even though it was kind of, they'd, they'd gotten to where it was more or less a white corn. But it still had a lot of the other goodies in there. And a lot of the other stuff that he encountered, that it, a lot of that was still around. And so all, if you, all you had to do was just plant a bunch of it, and you'd have all these other types pop up. And then he would just grab a hold of them and start guiding it right back. It wasn't that big of a deal. And, uh, and then he got a hold of the, the Cherokee white eagle was what was a traditional really kind of like always around with the Cherokee. And it was a blue and white dent corn. And, uh, and, and uh, that one was pretty much like straight out of the tradition. But some of the others he would get, and then he would get, he communicated with a lot of different of the tribes and he would get certain things, and sometimes he would see stuff popping up in his field that he would go, wow, they were asking for this one. I'm going to take it back to them. You know, right. he would see stuff that they were describing what they wanted, and he didn't have it, and he would find it and repatriate it or rematriate it, uh, as we say today, to those people, and they would go, oh, my God, we just found our spirituality back again. And so his mission essentially was to reconnect because the seed was part of their lost story in the epigenetics or the spiritual component that epigenetics is simply a physical re reflection, you know, that we are exploring now these days, that there's an energetic and spiritual view that the corn is a record keeper. Okay. He hands back the thread of the story that they had lost. Yeah. And there you are. They, it was like they, you know, through all these things that happened, these native people, they, a lot of them lost that seed. They lost the story. They lost their, their connection, you know, and they were sort of wandering around trying to like get gelled back into that and get like, you know, like, focused back in and he helped a lot of them do that you know wow huh what was that somebody said something in the background i didn't quite hear oh or maybe it was an echo well, maybe it was i'm getting an echo in my voice so here a little does bit. anyone have questions we don't want to keep people you know we try to keep yeah. it an hour but we always go a little bit late and especially if there's some questions but if you've got something that's really moved you or you want to understand about Greg, I'll just finish by saying that um, I've been around a lot of corn breeders, um, university trained, PhDs, um, and I have lots of questions about corn, about its colors and how it works. And, and I've had a similar experience with all of them at one point or another. And that is where I start asking such detailed questions about trying to explain what's happening in my own cornfield and they yeah. their eyes glaze over yeah. and they get kind of mystical about it and they i do, realized, yeah and it was it was kind of frustrating <laughs> because i go you're the yep. damn scientist you guys should have the answers and you realize yeah. 
you know, over decades, I've come to realize that none of them understand corn very well. And I just wanted to pass that on to our, to the people that have shown up here tonight as the background for all of this. Nobody really has it down. There are magical, yeah. mystical, surprising things that happen in every cornfield. And I like the idea that um, it has a message for us and that we can, through our actions and our spirit, um, learn a lot from it. That they actually are, as you said so famously, Greg, um, they are like scrolls of information yeah. for us and that we're learning to listen again. And I think that would help the scientists, actually, if they admitted that. So. Well, there was a scientist that understood this. And I need to probably go back and, and look at her work. There was a lady by the name of Barbara McClintock. Oh, right. Yep. And she so, did her work back in the 50s. She got it. She right. knew the other side of it. Well, she's, she's she famous also, for she was the incredible. theory of epigenetics, right? To try to explain. Uh, gene jumping. Tra yeah, yeah, the gene yeah. jumping thing. And transposons. Yeah. But yeah. she knew, she understood that, that. She understood the other stuff. Yeah. They're yeah. out there. <laughs> wow, that's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just a lot of fun, but like, you know, we're all just playing around with seeds and, and, and uh, passing them around. And that's, you know, that's all it is. It just took me to give it to you and thing exploded, you know? <laughs> I mean, I didn't know. I just, oh, Bill, yeah, you want to try this? Here, here's another person here. I'll see what happens. You know, it was nothing but that, you know, and uh, it was just the timing, you know, the I, timing was right. Greg, I yeah. heard, uh, I heard a uh, European, that was a quote from a European radio station that did a story on Glass Gym recently say it, it was probably the most widely grown open pollinated corn on the planet now. It's huh. been gr grown even in Antarctica, all the continents. Hmm. And Somebody grew a greenhouse, a greenhouse in Antarctica with... Yeah, they, more than a hundred yeah. countries by more Jeez. people. It, you know, it is, and it will probably oh. end up being the most popular corn in the 21st century as far as, it won't be yield, but it will be, yeah. have touched the hearts of people, you know, more than well, any other I just, corn. And, you know, it is, it's <laughs> like, it's kind of like a satisfaction to know that it did some good. It helped, you know, it helped, you know, helped like do some, a positive thing in the world, you know, and it's just, to me, just that is, is worth, you know, anything. It's worth more than all, all the gold in China. Somebody could come give me all the gold in China. I said, no, nah, I'll have this, this knowing better. You know, if I had to trade that for the gold in China, I'd go, nah, you can have it. <laughs> you can keep it. <laughs> well, because great, just, literally, you, you know, we all try to, we all, you know, we all try to just do the right thing. And hopefully it has a, you know, a good outcome for people. And it's the seed that did it. That's the power. You know, we all just, we all just like did our little piece in the chain. You know, that was all it was, you know, and know that every time you give a seed to somebody, you never know where it's going to go and what, in what effect it's going to have. So just for everybody that, you know, that's what we all do is we pass the seed around, you know, and that's, that's all we can do. You know? So aren't you glad <laughs> that you didn't patent it and try to control it? Think of the burden. Oh God, yeah. That would be. Oh Instead, yeah, it would have just. Yeah. It couldn't have. It couldn't have been the same. You know. Uh, you know, Larry. I don't know if you ever meet Larry Sally. Oh yeah. He's the guy. Yeah. Uh, and he told me in there around that time he said it was right when it was hitting the street and you were you were getting ready to go with it and I was talking to him and he said Greg you know this stuff. Is, and I have like a big batch of it, you know, I'm sitting on. And he goes, Greg, this stuff is selling on eBay for $5 a seed. And I, <laughs> without blinking an eye, I just said, Larry, I'm not going there. Yeah. And he yeah. said, and he said, I understand, you know, and I never yeah. looked back, He's, you know, <laughs> well, think, so, you know, <laughs> think about how, I don't think it would have had the same. I don't think it would have gone the same way. I, just, well, like, think about I don't how, have any regrets. Yeah, think, no regret. Think about how wealthy you are, though. You could literally go anywhere in the world and people would take care of you. Mm. You know, people oh. all over the world have cried from the beauty of yeah. this, and your name is attached to that. To me, that's really. Well, and I, it's, it you know, was really real unintended. Wealth. Yeah, it's like, it's kind of like I kind of go, well, I don't want to like 
wear that thing on my sleeve. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, if people come to me and say, I really like this, I said, I'll try to give them, I said, here's a bunch more that, yeah. you know, in case somehow you lost some diversity in there, because sometimes people don't grow as much as they ought to, you know, they grow just too, too few plants. And I said, here, let me give you about 300 seeds here and start fresh. Cause I'm like, I, when somebody comes to me and says they, they've done, they've like, even if they're in another country, uh, I say, hey, let me send you some. I've got enough to just send it to people. That's what we're doing. This is seed steward thing with Leanne. I just want to make sure that whatever they've got is got all the juice in it, you know, mm-hmm. so that if they're if they're giving it away and passing it around, you know, because uh, it can get, you know, if if it's if it's grown too restricted, it can kind of get a little, you know, compromised. And so, you know, we all know about that inbreeding and stuff and corn is really you know particular about that one and uh but that's my deal is like i try to just say hey you know let's do that and uh and and you know i'll I'll get i'll get you some seeds you know and i'm kind i'm kind of like getting overdue for growing a batch so i need to grow another batch <laughs> but, take care uh, of but i children. have some really good stuff yeah take care of those guys but I'm just glad it's out there boun- bouncing around. And even if people, I think if people tried crossing it with stuff like the, my train station vision, if it gets mixed up in other other heritage corns and creates a whole new, like bizarre like type thing, I, I'm going, hey, why not? You know, it's just you know endless possibilities. You know, uh, so we'll see. You know, <laughs> and uh, let them have fun with it. Yeah. Wow, look what it's taught you. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so Craig, anyway, we, well, um, we actually yeah. can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We actually gave some breathing room around this one. So we have a few more minutes. Um looks like my internet. Yeah, if people want to chime in. I know there's other people listening. Yeah. Yeah, Elizabeth Johnson is with us and she had sent that beautiful photo you were emailed in included in that um and i don't know elizabeth if you want to share some of your experience working with the glass gym if there's anything that kind of came up for you during your journey with it well it's been part of, part of the journey with uh, glass gem was you know as as coming up as a white american and 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 all of that that part of the biggest lesson for me that corn is all about community and so yeah. the last gem is like the ambassador it's it's the the this extraordinary beauty that everyone has to see and no matter no matter what their cultural background and um but to grow it you have to learn about community and because yeah. it has to have community to be strong so that's yeah. Uh, part of Glass Gem journey for me. Yeah. Wow. Corn teaches yeah, I got us your again. email, and I will be answering. I'll be answering your email. I did. Leanne forwarded me the email from you. Oh, thanks. Uh, I believe you were you were the one that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll have to look at that photograph because I I didn't know there was a photograph in there, so I'll look at it. Uh, yeah. And where do you live? Uh, San Luis, Elizabeth. California. Oh, you're over there. Okay, great. Okay. Um, yeah, I saw you mentioned that, that area and then, yeah. Um, uh, when do you guys start planting corn out there? You probably already have. Um, yes, I, I, Oh yeah. It's, it's probably three feet tall by now. Or no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually not that warm here. Uh, so it's, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, it started, it's about, uh, six to eight inches. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, well, it's probably too late to read. I, I, yeah, you got some from different, I, I'd be up for like sending you a batch for some of my original stuff. That's, you know, been kind of kept the big mix in it, uh, at some point. So I'll, I'll get your, you know, I'll get your, uh, I'll send you a note on the, well, I and, did, uh, I, 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 I it was really, oh, you got it from Leanne. You got it from Leanne. And that was what I was doing. Yeah. We sent, we'd made all those new packages up. I, good. I, I, you got the you got the good stuff then. It's all good stuff, but I mean it it hadn't gotten narrowed down at all through some of the different things that are see what happens is when sometimes people would buy it from, you know, one of the people that was selling it and they maybe have twenty five seeds. 
And you want to have 300 plants to get all the genetics there, if you follow what I'm saying. And, uh, and a lot of people started with maybe just a hand, like 300, like, like 25 seeds. And they founded like a whole, you know, seed save on 25 seeds. And while I'm saying, well, it might have lost a little bit of its diversity in that process. And, uh, um, so when that's why I say when I hear of somebody that really likes, I said, well, let me send you like I did to you through Leanne, a batch of three, four hundred seeds, and just start a big old patch, and just grow the heck out of it, and and then go with go with that. You know, if you've been successful growing it at all, I know that means you can grow corn, and, uh, and that's what. So you did that. That's what we were intent. That was the intent of getting a bunch of it to Leanne to say like get it out to the seed stewards. So they can start, and then, then it's about community. They get a really nice grow out, and they get all that seed, and they give it out to the schools and to the different things, and get it into the community. And you know that was what I was trying to do in northern New Mexico, but I, you know, I just passed. I never heard back. I just give it out to people, and it wasn't until the native seed search thing happened that it really like made a difference. But uh, anyway. That's what you're doing. Go for it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for picking up that 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 thread then, because that was why we did that, and and we can do more of that too. You know, get it Excellent. out there fresh like that. I think Elizabeth's yeah. lineage goes back be before that in the email. Elizabeth, you said you had it from Bill and Bell, I think. No, that yeah, was right. where the picture, the corn in the picture came from. Bill and Bell Native Seed Search. Yeah. But yeah, I, right. Yeah. Again, I got the seed at the Santa Fe conference. Oh, that's uh, right. oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, we were giving it out in big chunks like that. Yeah, that was what that was about. Okay, you're that's right. You said you were at the seed summit. Yeah. Yeah, that's what yeah, that's we try to just keep working on it, you know. <laughs> it really and, is. Uh, I know it's growing the, growing the seed can be a lot of work. Huh? Well, I just think about the community that it has brought together and Elizabeth mentioning yeah. community and then we think yeah. about if we could tr see all the threads, all the places this has gone. It's just yeah. amazing. And the way that you, I really appreciate the way that you express the language beyond words that is um, threaded through corn, but not just corn, seeds in general. And um, yeah. just a funny oh, yeah. little Thing here I just pulled out my notebook to take notes of what you were saying and you can't see it Greg but I one of your beauty way beans was right there next to my notebook I don't know why or how but uh, other than that you know it's another one that you've passed along and and worked on yeah. um, and a really beautiful story as well I guess we're kind of running low on time but anything yeah. you want to mention on the beauty way well, I got it from the, you know, the, those are the runner beans, you know, that species, the runner beans are originally from Central America. That species is from there and that's been traded up through, you know, Mexico and into the Southwest. It's like corn, you know, it's been moved with people. And, uh, um, you know, you've heard of, you've heard of the scarlet runner bean, you plant them and they have red flowers and the bees love them and everything. Well, a lady in Arizona shared me some of these about seven years ago and they had all these different colors and she, she gave me about 30 of them and she said these were found in a cave you know it was one of those stories found in the cave you know and you know we all go yeah how can a seed last centuries in a cave well maybe i don't know we it's an urban legend i mean to me it's like whether you believe it or not it's kind of an interesting story you know it's kind of like yeah it's kind of like do you believe in Santa Claus? Well, I don't know. It's kind of a cool story, you know. I mean, it inspires all those children, you know. It's neat, you know, and maybe it did last that long. So she gave me these, and I started growing them and growing them and got a bunch of them, and they were really starting to diversify into more colors, and I'm going, damn. But it was like there was only – the colors were more like – the patterns and the pinks and the blues and the dark, 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 dark purples, no, pinks and purples and dark, dark colors and weird kind of army green kind of stuff. And I uh, so this stuff is really, really pretty, but wouldn't it be neat if a blue would 
manifest. The next harvest, I saw some that I thought, that sure does look blue. And so I, I kind of pulled them aside and grew them. And after about two years, there are three different patterns that are have a distinct blue cast. Because I just thought the purple and the, the pur purple and pink coloration would mask anything that even tried to be blue. You know, I was like letting my logical side kind of like say, eh, no way that could happen. But I just kind of went, wouldn't it be neat? Like I just put the possibility out there and there the blues came and now there's blues in there and they stabilized, you know, and so they're in the mix now. And then I think I got you some of that. I got you, made sure you got some so they had those blues in there. And anyway, the central, I mean, so the native people up here have uh, a, a white runner bean. There's a, and there's different ones that supposedly were found in the cliff dwellings and different places. The Santo Domingo people in the Pueblo up here have a white runner bean. So there's that trade that did create that from coming out of Central America up to here. Because if you try to plant a Central American runner bean, the day length will mess them up and they'll just, they'll never flower. I tried that. I got some from Guatemala. And I thought, holy cow, there's some yellows and it was really pretty. They never flowered for me. But they adapted it as they brought them up. And now the runner beans in the Southwest are fine. They'll, they'll flower, the bees go after them, and they'll make your pods, you know. And uh, But that's a pretty one. And and that one I've, held, I've gotten out there to a bunch of people just because it's like, this one's got to go somewhere. It's like telling me, go, get me out there. So here they are, legendary beauty wave beans. And I didn't name that. It was the people that traded and gave it among themselves in eastern Arizona just to call it the legendary beauty wave beans. And I'm okay. <laughs> that sounds like good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. So they're fun. They're huge. They're like jelly beans. They're giant, you know. So great. Yeah, awesome. If you want to grow, run. That's yeah. it. We're out of time. Uh, no, well, I wanted to, I'll send you a copy of this picture I've just found the other day. When you gave me, you know, uh, let me be a seed steward for your corns. Mm -hmm. And we grew them out that first year at the yeah. end of that year in October. Uh, we yeah. had our first seed school, the very first seed school yeah. we did. Oh, and, and the, yeah. And um, part of the class um, curriculum was to go out into this field of corn that you had given me and no, nobody had seen it. I hadn't seen it growing. And the picture I've got up on the screen for everyone is the very first year that we opened. Wow. Okay. And yeah. inspired, uh, and Benjamin Farr, a great permaculturist from the Bay Area was there and actually recorded that whole thing. And there were people crying. <laughs> Damn. You know, it was just sort of our creation. Story. You never That's know what you're going to get. No, you never know it, what you're going to get. You just don't know. The first one jumps picture. out. Oh, first my God. Yeah. yeah. It said, pick me. This is the one. We're going to oh, wow. on the roll now. So, yeah. it's really Yeah. Cool. I mean, that's kind of neat because sometimes you don't, you know, sometimes you get some that are sort of okay. Yeah. But to get the first one like that, because, yeah, that's happened to me before. Like, oh, I'm finally going to, here's one that's brown enough to pick. And, oh, my God. Yeah. And and then you might pick a bunch of them. You just don't, you may not see quite like that one, you know. Yeah. So you were lucky there. You were, it was part of the, is part of the, the destiny there. Is it luck there or, or did something. they know? <laughs> it know. was, yeah, they, you were like, your hand went er, over to that one. <laughs> Well, you had, because you had a class, that, well, the year that I brought them, brought you that seed, you were doing a class too, the year before. You were doing some kind of workshop when I came well, over. Well, we were doing workshops, seed. but we finally put it together, and that first seed school was 10 days. And it's now yeah. legendary. Penn Parmenter, who has Penn's Mountain Seeds, yeah. was there. And oh, yeah. uh, Rebecca Newburn, yeah. okay. who, the mother okay. of the seed library movement nationwide. Oh, yeah, there. her, yeah, right. And Toby yeah. Hemingway, wow. the great permaculturist. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. came and it was just and Gary Nabin came and gave a lecture and it was just yeah, a yeah. gathering of wow. these superstars and we walked out into wow, the, no kidding. the yard wow. and Glass Jim was there saying hey you know I'm I'm here <laughs> and the rest is history as they say you were lucky because I tried growing it one year in Cottonwood when I was there in Cottonwood Arizona and it was hot and it never set 
anything. So you you had a mild enough summer, or you probably started it later, so that when it was pollinating, it wasn't brutally hot, Could and you be. were fortunate because it yeah maybe that's how you do it in Arizona just plant it a lot later, so it's tasseling when it's maybe less than you know maybe ninety or something and no right. more. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I did it. I had it like coming to tassel when it was like a hundred and five, and it just forget it didn't didn't go anywhere, and. Uh, and but uh no so yeah i'm glad i was able to get that to you in in 2009 uh uh you know get it out there yeah well i'm going to be ready for some seed for next year so um, okay save out yeah. some good stuff for me wherever you want me to go <laughs> well what leanne should have some if, if leanne needs more from the stuff we were just sending out those things to seed stewards that we're now calling Rainbow Jewel because it's you know just sort of fresh start. Uh, I I could get you if she's run out of that. I can just send you a batch if you want to do a bunch. Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, and you know maybe it is maybe you could do a experiment. I actually started it one year on the first of August, way back when I was first growing it in Oklahoma before I ever came out here. I said I wonder what happened because they don't have freeze until like November. Right. So I st I planted it on the 1st of August going into short days and it accelerated its flowering to where it was a 90 day corn instead of 110 day. Wow. And uh, and on the 1st of October I harvested it. So right. going into shorter days it snaps it into so you might experiment with that. Okay. Figuring when it'll go to tassel oh, and if it's going to be be milder cuz I just did a regular planting when I was in cottonwood. Just thinking, oh, corn likes it hot. You know, I just, I didn't know. I mean, I'm still learning about the thing. And uh, and then I later find out, oh, no, if it's 95 or above when the pollen is flying, it won't make. And yeah, it I, didn't. <laughs> I've, I've gotten co corn planting here August 1st. I call it uh, corn on the karma. <laughs> you have to be lucky. Okay. Aww. If you do that, you then you got, you got it. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I you've got it. wasn't it. glass okay. gem, but yeah. Yeah, but any any of these, uh, they do go into they do respond to the short days because what I've noticed oh. when I plant it later is it'll it'll tassel when it's a lot shorter. That's all. I I went okay. That's what's going on with this stuff. Wow. You wow. know. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. we are all coming right. up to the end of our our scheduled time together. So. Um, and my, I'm about to probably lose power and I don't like raggedy Indians. Yeah. Of course, we'll see yeah. a lot of you tomorrow. And I hope that yeah. this has really grounded you in the spirit of seeds. And uh, we'll jump into a lot of things over the next couple of days. What a pleasure to be here with you tonight, Greg. I yeah. really felt a lot of peace coming from you. I always do. And, and your work with seeds. And I thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you know, we're kicking off yeah. as, as honoring yeah. our Seed Elders series uh, for the rest of this, well, for our next series of our Seed Socials. And I think we just kicked it off yeah. tonight, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll have you back, too. Yeah, yeah we'll have you so back. So you do like, you're going to do like another series later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're going to okay. keep the Thursday night socials flowing. So we invite everyone to continue okay. to join us here. Yeah. Bill, do you want to mention next week? Yeah, special? we've got um, Forrest Schomer is going to be here next week. He started in 1973. And this predates wow. Seed Savers Exchange. He started yeah. um, uh, Abundant Life Seed Foundation. Yeah. And so, which became the Organic Seed Alliance later. He, oh, okay. Yeah. He, yeah. he ran that for 25 years, a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was to have yeah. a local network of seed growers and sharers. Uh, it was based out of Port Townsend, Washington. Um, yeah. And so after 25 years, Forrest let young people take over. Uh, Matt yeah. Dillon was one of those people. They quickly uh, morphed it into a, a different mission, which was Organic Seed. But the organization is still growing strong. And then yeah. Forrest uh, went back to the forest. And so he started gathering uh, uh, native and wild seeds and making them available yeah. in a little company yeah. called Inside Passage. And so this will be his wow. 42nd year. He's gathered wild God. seeds and made them available. And so for me, he's wow. one of my seed elders. 
And yeah. I've always been impressed by his spirit and integrity to the seed and what he's doing. And so, um, and he's got a lot of experience both with business and with nonprofits. So if you know anybody who's kind yeah. of wants to come up in any part of the seed world, um, and keep their integrity. Yeah. Uh, Forrest is the guy to ask questions to. Wow. Next Thursday night. Yeah, that's a there's magic in going out and 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 getting just picking a few of these native plant seeds and actually getting them to like bond with you, you know, by growing. And it's you might be the first human that's ever touched a seed in that stand since the dawn of time, and you're like, you know, there you are. That's kind of like the native wow. seed thing is like amazing. And then you can, you know, you actually get it to grow and it becomes what it is. There's some of them that will really, you know, be okay with being around humans, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we need that now. We need those connections more than ever. So thank you. And, yeah. you know, thanks, Liz, um, thanks for mentioning community and everyone thanks for being yeah. here and being part of the community and take take good care and we'll look forward to being together yeah. tomorrow and onward good night everybody okay we'll stay in touch all